Hi everybody and welcome to the channel, I am Richard. Today I'm bringing you with me back to the 80s in Sweden. But things might not look the way you remember it, because in this world we have big walking machines. We have a huge particle accelerator on the ground making weird noises and making our everyday life a bit odd. You are not portraying as any big hero or military person at all in this game, you are merely a teen, going on in your day-to-day -day life trying to do your chores but also go out on a bit of adventure. I'm going to show you Tales from the Loop. This is a cool game from Free League Games where you portray as a teen going around here trying to figure out what is going on. I'm going to show you the setup of this game, I'm going to give you an overview of this game but also show you the rules so once you have watched this video, you are ready to go out in this world and explore. This is the setup of the game. And depending on which mission you choose, the setup might look a bit different. There are seven missions in this game and it's recommended that you start with the one called But Amok. On the other side of this card, you can find setup information. Here you have the name of this quest. Here you have a little bit of description, a winning goal, here you have which rumor set you should use and which rumor cards down here. These cards here are the rumor cards. On these cards you can see a symbol in the middle. So you should take the ones that corresponds with the symbol on the quest cards. When you have taken these rumor cards you should shuffle them real good and place it on the rumor draw deck spot on the board face down. You also need to look which starting diary you should have. This one says B1, meaning these cards over here. As you can see here we have B1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7. These should be placed with the A side up, starting with the first number. Here we have a description on what have happened in this world and what we need to achieve. As the mission moves on and we progress in the mission, we will go through these, this deck from B1 going down and down until we have gone through them all and hopefully finished the mission. On the mission card we also have where the starting machines should be placed. Here we have a Parasurfer at F8, meaning that we should put the Parasurfer looking like this on F8. All the robots are placed in the big squares on the map and not on the locations themselves. We do the same thing with the other two robots, the fire guard at C7, meaning C7, and the watchdogs at A4. Each machine also have a corresponding machine sheet. These should be placed with this side facing up, depending on how many players you are. This is a three player game, so we have the two to three player facing up. Each machine also have a response card. These are double sided. And depending on where the machines are placed on the map, they will have different sides facing up. The one with the orange ribbons here should be facing up if the machines are placed nearby a closed location. The orange ones on the map are considered to be closed locations and the white ones are considered to be open locations. So the watchdogs up here for example are nearby a closed location and have the orange ribbon side up called the alert side. And it should be placed on their response card spot on their machine sheet. The Parasurfer and the Fire Guard are not nearby a closed location, so they have their routine side facing up. In this mission we also have an event location. This one is G, the Satina Spiders, and these tiles should be placed on the map, where they correspond to the map itself. Last thing we need to place out is the school cards, looking like this. 
again these should be shuffled real good and be placed face down on the school draw deck space. Next to the machines we also have some firewall tokens facing down. These ones are later used to hack the machines. We also have some hack tokens up here. These are also used when we try to hack machines. I will show this in a bit. Each player then choose a kid that they would like to portray as. This here is Nils the weirdo. We then need to take a favor token here and put it in the smiley face spot on the board. We also need to take a trade tile. These are double sided and again we need to look at how many players we are to know which side should be facing up and place them in the trade tile space. On this board you can also see what kind of iconic item this kid has. Meaning that we should find this item in the item deck and put it next to our player board. We then need to find our corresponding stand E and place that on the Steinhamra location with an M. This is the school of this village. Each player also gets six time cubes. These will be used to making actions. Each player should also draw two chores cards looking like this. They then need to choose which one to keep and put the other one back into the deck. And we then need to reshuffle the chores. We should put the little cross here on Monday on the first week up on the weekly schedule. We should place the enigma and the insights on zero on this track. Now each player draws the top card from the rumor deck and places it face down on the rumor track, starting from 1 and going to 4. If we draw the same letter twice, we need to put the last letter we just draw aside and draw a new one. Once we have drawn the cards, we need to look at the letters to see where we should put out rumor tokens on the board. As you can see here we got J, meaning this location here, so we need to put a rumor token on that location. Then we have N, which is down here, and A, which is all the way up here. The cards that we have just put aside get shuffled back into the rumor deck. Next to the board we also have some anomaly cards and item cards. These should also be shuffled up real good. The player who last saw an 80s movie gets the first player token and gets to become the first player of this round. So in this game you portray as teens. We are located in Sweden in Mälaren and it is the 80s, kind of, because it doesn't really look like we remember it. And you are merely portraying as a teen. But you're quite a curious teen, so every day after school you go out on adventure to try to figure out what is going on. And depending on which scenario you have chosen, you need to find out different clues and solve different problems. So before we start to actually play the different games, we need to look at the diary cards. Because they will give us an indication on what we want to do now and how we want to do it. We will go around this town and we will also get the rumor tokens here that will give us rumor cards. The rumor cards will give us better items and equip us in a better way to take on the different quests that we go out on. This game is played out during three different phases and the first one is the school phase. The first step during the school phase is the preparation phase. And the first thing we do is to check the diary cards. And this is a good thing to do and read out loud for all players to hear so everybody knows what is going on and what needs to be done. We also need to check if we have completed any of the objectives and then follow the instructions on the cards. We also need to replenish our player boards. Of course this is not done in the first round because we haven't used any time tokens yet. But if we had, we would now remove these from the board and put them next to our player board. If this is not our first round, we now need to slip all the rumor cards one spot to the right. 
In this game we have a weekly schedule, and as the round goes on, the days will proceed. At the start of the game, each player got a chore. These needs to be completed before Friday, the first week. Once we come into Monday, the second week, each player will get a new chore. This one should be completed by Thursday, the second week. Again, this is of course not done during your first round. So now we move into the school day, and we need to place our standees at the school. So during the weekdays, they go to school. But only weekdays, and not weekends. Now this is our first round, so they're already there, but if it hadn't been our first round, these ones would have been in their home locations instead. And now they move to the school. The first player then draws a school card. We then need to refill the rumor track with new rumor cards on the empty spots. To know how many cards we should place here, we need to look at the school card in the top left corner. This symbol here means that we should draw as many cards as there is players. And these ones here means that we should draw as many as there's players, minus one, or in this case, minus two. The rumor track is only filled if this is not your first round. But let's say it's not. We would need to fill the rumor track with three cards. Because on the school card, it says that we have to draw three cards because we are three players. But there's only one available spot here. So what do we do? Well, we need to push the two rightmost cards away from this track, leaving space for three new cards. We refill the market with three cards, but we will get a penalty. For every card that we remove from the rumor track that we have not solved during our adventure phase, we will get two enigmas per card. So in this case we had two cards, meaning that we will gain four enigmas. Moving the enigma tracker up by four. We will of course also need to put out new rumor tokens on the new rumor cards location that we have gotten because some of these might have disappeared and there might be new ones now out on the map for us to explore. The next step is the school event. And this is where the first player needs to resolve this school card. And to do that, they usually need to take some kind of test. But to see how we resolve tests, we need to look at the card itself, but also our player boards. Every now and then you will be asked to complete a test. And depending on which symbol you have out here, you will have to test different things. This here says that you should test charming. But how do we complete tests? Well, we roll dice. As a standard, you get to roll three dice. And a six is considered to be a success. But we do have modifiers depending on which kind of skill set your team has. This one here has brave, meaning that when they try to complete a test with a heart, they get plus two dice, giving them a total of five die. But if this team is testing their toughness, they are not that strong, they're actually weak, meaning that they can only roll two dice instead. The test on this card was a charming test, meaning that none of these will affect this team, giving him a roll with three dice. When you roll the dice, you simply see if you have managed to get a 6. If you have not, like in this case here, you have failed. But if one of these results would have been a 6, we would have succeed. But we're not all alone. On this school card here, we can look in the top right corner and it actually allows this teen's friends to help out with this test. And for every kid that helps you, you get plus one die. But some of the cards won't let you receive any help at all, meaning that this one needs to be completed by the first player alone. While other cards require each player to try to complete the test by themselves. So when you do your test, you get to roll your dice to see if you got a 6. If you do not, it's not all over because you can actually do something that is called push. Meaning that you take one of your available time cubes and you pick a condition of your choice, put in a cube at that condition. Now you get to re-roll all the dice again 
to see if you hopefully get a success. Now we're done with the school day and we move into the machine actions. And again, we need to look at the school card, but this time we look at the lower bottom part because now it's first time for us to check if any hacked machines are not hacked anymore. Meaning that if we have managed to hack a machine in our last round and the symbol in the left corner pops up, they might not be hacked anymore. Because if the previous school card that you have just drawn has the same symbol, those machines are no longer considered to be hacked. And now you do not control them anymore. When we have seen if there's any machines that are not hacked anymore, it's time to move the machines around. Again, using the bottom part of the school card. So how do we know which machine we should move? Well, each symbol here is representing one of the different machines. And if we look at the machine sheet and the school card sheet, we can see that it is the same symbol. Going from left to right on the bottom part of the school card, we will move each machine in the same direction as the arrow has. The arrows means that they move in this direction and the crosses mean that they stand still. So if we look at the watchdogs here, for example, we can see that they move right and then they move down, meaning that we should move these two cool robots here to the right and then down. Remember that the robots always stands on the big squares and not on the locations themselves. The machines does never walk out into the water because they might get rust or something. And they can never stand on the same sector as another machine. So if this should happen, you simply move the machine as far as you can and then you stop the movement. And remember that depending on which sector they're standing in, their response cards might change. So this parasurfer here have moved into a sector that is nearby a closed location, meaning that now they would change their card from routine to alert. And the same thing happens with the fire guard as well. The watchdogs on the other hand, they have moved away from the closed location and now they are not nearby any closed locations only open location so their card goes from the alert state to the routine state instead. If a machine is on alert and move into a non-alert area but they have a hack token from a previous failed hacker attack the card does not change but the hack token disappears. That was the school phase. We have sent the kids to school, they have taken a school card, they have done their tests, we have moved the robots around, changed the cards if we needed to, and now we move into phase number two. This is the adventure phase. School is over now and it's time for these teens to get out into the world and explore a bit. But what can you actually do? To take actions in this game you need to spend time. And each of these cubes represents one hour. These are the different actions you can take. And to take an action, for example walk, you take your little time cube here and you put it up in this field. Representing that you have spent one hour to walk. You can spend up to two time cubes to move. Moving one step for each cube you use. So here we would, for example, take our standee and move him one and two steps. Each of these circle locations are one step. And remember that the characters move on these locations, but the robots move in the big squares. Just be aware, because if you move into a location with robots nearby, you might have to take a test. If we move to a location nearby a robot, we need to look at their response card under a void. If there is a text, this means that we would need to test one of the abilities stated in this field to be able to avoid the robot. Here we would need to test cleverness or toughness to see if we are able to stand at this location. Underneath you can see what happens if you do not pass the test. If the robot has this green check here, well they do not care about you at all and you can stay where you are. So you could walk, 
but you can also spend one time cube to take the bus. But you need to be located at one of the bus stops on the map. Once you have done this, you are able to ride between two of the bus stops locations. Another way to transport yourself around the map is to ask for a favor. Here you would need to spend one time and then collect one favor by moving this favor cube one step to the right. You can only use this favor if you are in good favor. So from here on now, well, you do not have any favors left. Using this action here will let you move to any open location on the map. And then you can choose to spend time to scout, meaning that you will look at one of the rumor cards on the board. But you need to be on or next to a location with the letter corresponding to one of the cards. If you are, you can pick up that card and then you can read and see what it says. But the kids can also scout on machines. If they are nearby a machine, they get to take a look at a machine's left most firewall. These firewalls are the ones that we need to hack to be able to hack the machine. If our kid is located on a location that has the same letter as any of the rumor cards, they can choose to spend time to investigate that card. Meaning that they would pick up the card and then they would read what kind of challenge they need to face. And then we would need to do a test. On the rumor card we can see what type of rumor we're facing and what challenge we need to complete. Here, Stefan needs to complete a clever challenge. Unfortunately, he is not that clever. This is his weak ability, meaning that he will only roll two dice instead of the standard three. So he now have to roll two dice and get at least one success to be able to pass this challenge, which is pretty damn hard. But as you can see down here, the rumor cards have another way of actually completing the quest. Here we have a word saying interface, giving us an opportunity to actually craft the item needed to complete this quest. By using items. Here for example you can see that we have cables and if we combine the cables with a computer we get interface. I have cables, I have a computer, so I have interface. Meaning that I can discard these two items here to get an automatic success. If I succeed I do the text stated under success and if I fail I read the failure part. Just be aware because each kid can only carry a maximum of four items and this is including their iconic item. If you have more than four items on your kid by the end phase you will have to discard down. Every time you succeed with an investigation you gain one insight. But if you fail the investigation you gain one enigma instead. If the kids are at the same location, they can also spend some time to trade with each other. And they can trade items, for example, or anomalies. But you cannot trade your iconic item. So Nils the Weirdo here, for example, would not be able to trade away his bike. But any other thing that he has carrying on himself can be traded. And remember that items and anomalies are quite good if you want to solve these cards, because in this way you can combine items or anomalies to crack this one without using the dice, which will give you a certain completion, but only if you have the right item, remember? And then you can of course also choose to try to hack the machine. Now these machines have some costs to be able to hack. And you will need to spend a certain amount of time to be able to hack this machine. Depending on how many firewalls the machine have on their machine sheets, you will need to spend some different amounts of time. The Parasurfer here, for example, has two firewalls. So we will need to spend two time, meaning two hours, to hack this machine. But your friends can actually help you. If your friends is in a nearby location to the machine you're trying to hack, they can also spend time so you can reach the amount you need. But it's only the player that spends the most time that will become the hacker and get control over the machine. If there's ever a tie here between the different players, 
the first player got the power and will choose the one that becomes the hacker. But how do you hack a machine? It sounds dangerous and illegal, right? Well, yeah, it is. But these kids just doesn't seem to care that much. In this case, on the Parasurfer, we can see that they're in their routine state and we already have one visible firewall token. Meaning that probably some of the kids have already scouted on this one to figure out what they're facing. But if we had not scouted this one already, there would have been nothing here. And we would have had to take in one firewall token at random from the pile. And then put it up on the first field on the firewall track. Once you know what you're facing, then you can start to hack it. And as this machine here is in its routine state, we start at the top part of the firewall token. This is the routine state. And to see what we need to complete, we need to look at the machine's response card. Up here, it will tell us what test we need to take and we need to complete. But let's say that the machine was in an alert state. Well, then things change a bit, because then we would not do the top part of the firewall token. We would have gone straight and down to the alerted part instead and taken that test. The same thing happens if you're trying to complete a routine test, but you fail, then you would need to have to move down to the bottom part to take the alert test now instead, and then change the card on the machine as well. So if you fail a routine test, you go down to the alerted test and you try again. But if you fail an alerted test, you now need to take a look at the routine response card and do an avoid test. And this happens to all of the characters that are involved in hacking these machines. Besides doing the test, they will also need to move one step away from the machine itself, if they can. If you do complete the test, you simply move on to the next firewall and then you try to hack that one as well. And again, if you fail that test, you would have to do the alert part of the firewall token instead. But if you pass this test, you have actually managed to hack the robot and now you're in control of it. But how do we keep track on what we're doing? Because we might not even be able to hack this machine all at once. Well, we would need to use these hacker tokens. Placing them out wherever we are on the firewall track to keep a track on how much we have hacked and where we are when we come back to the machine and try again. But if you manage to hack this machine, you can now actually start to use the machine movements as well. So if you have managed to hack a machine, well, you kind of own it right now, or at least it's yours for a couple of rounds. And you can use this machine to walk around on the map. If you spend time, you can take the machine and move according to the grid. And you can also transport your friends with you. It's all according to the values on the machine's sheet. You can see how many movements they take, you can see how many you can take with you. And the machines themselves also have some of the combinations that you might need to complete some of the rumors. To be able to do the machine movements, the machine needs to be nearby you. And it can only move to sectors that has a location nearby as well. Remember, the machines are only in the big sectors and the kits are on the town locations. But when you use the machine, you can walk through other machines as well. But you can still not stop at the same location as another machine. But you could stop right next to it, for example. That's no problem. And this is a great way for you to get extra movements, but also be able to take a friend with you to wherever you want to go. When you are out on adventure in this world, trying to hack machines, break into closed spaces and trying to fix the different rumors here, you are eventually going to fail and in one or another way, you will get hurt or you will get a condition. There's five different conditions that you can get in this game and they more or less are all about locking up your time cubes here so you can't do as many actions as you would want to do. The conditions that can happen to your kids are grounded, exhausted, upset, scared and injured. If your favorite cubes ends up all the way to the left on the angry smiley face, you become grounded. 
meaning that you need to put two time cubes on the grounded spaces. You will first get these cubes back once the favorite cubes moves one step to the left. If your kid gets exhausted, you need to put a cube in this spot instead. The only way to relieve this one is to use the rest action. And then you get the cube back. If your kid gets upset, it cannot help any other player until this one is relieved. And you relieve this by either rest or getting help from another player. If they get scared, they can't use the extra die from their strings during any rolls. And this one can only be relieved in one of two ways. Either by resting or succeeding a test. The last condition is injured. Here we put the cube to the far left. At the end of each end phase, the cube will move one step to the right until it goes away. If your kid is injured, it gets a minus two die on all rolls and cannot use push on any rolls. If you get injured one more time, you simply put the cube on the leftmost available space. The last action you can do is to use one of your time cubes here to make it home for dinner, because all of these kids have a home location. If you use this action, you simply take your kid and you move it to the location stated on the top of the board under their name. This is a good thing because otherwise, well, your parents are going to be a bit pissed on you. If your kid is standing on a closed location, the orange ones, you will have to pay two cubes to make it home for dinner. But if you are in control of a robot, you will actually get a bonus and only pay one cube instead. The robot giving you a minus one time die. If your kid is already at home at the end of your turn, you of course don't need to pay anything at all. Once you have brought your kid home, you put the standee down to indicate that now this character is done for this turn. So that was the adventure phase. Hopefully we have been able to clear out a little bit of the rumors here and making progress on the quest itself to see what is going on here. Once we have done the adventure phase, we move into the end phase. And here we need to discard down to four items again. Remember, we can only have a maximum of four. And this is your iconic item included. And you can never discard or trade away your iconic item. You need that one. So once you have four items here, we move into the next step, which is the good or bad behavior. And this is where your parents might get a bit mad if you did not make it home. If you did not make it home, we move the favor cube here one step to the right. And if you hit the angry smiley face, you become grounded, locking up the two cubes on the grounded space. But if you did make it home for dinner, well, they're actually happy to see you and give you some spaghetti. And then you move the little favor cube one step to the left instead making your parents a bit more happy. And if you go from the angry face to the happy face, or a little bit more happy face, well, you finally get to unlock those two cubes that you have had locked up on the grounded spot. Once we have seen if we have been good or bad during our previous adventures, we need to now get some relief on our injuries, moving the cube on injuries one step to the right. And hopefully the next return we are uninjured. After the end phase, we would move into a new round. We would pass the first player token to the player on the left. Then we would reset our characters, standing them up here, getting ready for a new day in school first, remember? Moving them to the school location. We would then move all the rumors cards one step to the right, hopefully not getting a, an enigma, doing the school chores and so on. Also, moving the little turn token here on the weekly schedule one step to the right. Going from Monday, Thursday, Wednesday, and you, you know the days of the week. I don't need to tell you this. And basically, go on with a new round. And this is the way the game continues until you have either failed the mission or hopefully completed it. The quality in this game is quite quite good. You get the thick cool player boards here with the little carved out spaces for the cubes. The cards have this exclusive premium feel to them. They feel really nice in the hand. I probably wouldn't sleeve this just because of the feel of them. The little robots here are well made and looks really really cool. 
and probably deserve a little bit of paint on them, right? Then we have the standees here again with the cool artwork going hand in hand with this game. It really feels like I'm in the 80s here playing a little teenager running around just doing different things that I probably shouldn't do. The artwork on the cards are also really well made and has a really nice 80 feeling to them. All of the little components and items are just cut out straight from the 80s. In this game you will also have different scenario tokens and I haven't even showed you these yet. These are used in different scenarios to point out where a machine is, an animal is, or where there is an objective that you need to solve. Did I enjoy the game? Well, yeah, yeah, I did. I liked the gameplay, I liked the riddles, I liked the artwork of the game, and I liked the co-op mode where we have to work together to actually finish the objectives. Because this is not a one-player game where you can just solve everything yourself. You need your teammates to be able to complete the diaries. The downside about this game is that it's quite hard to learn. There's a lot of different things that will affect different happenings. For example, if you move into an open area or if you move into a closed location. With the different rumor cards here, what will happen once they move off the board? When do we move up Enigma? When do we move up Inside? What happens if a machine is on routine or alert state? There's a lot of things for you to keep in your head when you're playing this game. And learning it will take you a few test rounds before you actually get a hang of it. And sadly, the rules are not always that clear either, because you have to go into the FAQ. When you play the game, small questions will arise that you just can't find the answer of in the rulebook. But the FAQ will fix that for you. So if you feel like you want to put down the hours to learn this game and really get a hang of it, this game is a good game, because you have the riddle environment, you have the moves, I mean, you have no action or fighting in this game. This is just you being a teen, moving out, trying to solve different things that you think are weird. And I like that part a lot. And once I have gotten a hang of the game rules, it really flows quite well. But there's another downside on the cards. Because it will also take you some time to learn what the different cards actually does. Because they look quite similar. These are three different cards. We have school cards, chores, and rumors. But on this side, they look basically the same for the pure and new eye. And it will take you a few moments to get a hang of what the different cards are. But once you have gotten a hang of that, once you have understood how to use the items and the skill of the kids themselves, well, the game is quite fun and quite hard at times as well. And you become really, really happy every time you beat it. There you have it people, that was Tales from the Loop for you from Free League Games, a co-op game where you go back to the 80s and trying to figure out what is going on in this weird, weird society. The game, like I told you, I think I, I really like this game and if you like clues, if you like riddles, if you like to go out on adventure and trying to solve a puzzle, this one is for you. But you need to take the time to actually learn the rules before you do it. If you do not want to get into a heavier game with a lot of different rules and twists and turks, well, this one might not be for you. But if you're willing to take that time, I think that you are going to love the adventure that this game will give you. So that was it, people. That was the video for now. If you like this video, why not take the time to just throw it in a comment or something? Give me a thumbs up. Show me some appreciation. It gives me a smile on my lips every time I get a comment from you people. And if you like my content, if you like my channel, well, subscribe to the channel because there will be much more of it in the future. And until next time, people, please do not forget to keep on spreading that board gaming love I know you all have. Peace.